Hiya and welcome. I am Sabrina and this is Every Seven Years, a podcast inspired by the fact that every seven years you essentially have a new body. And this body has been created by you, by your habits, your choices, your environment, your lifestyle. Like nature, you are constantly cycling and rebuilding. And just like a tree requires ample water and nutrients, fresh air and sunlight, you too require constant attention and proper care. But in today's society, we've become really distracted and very good at ignoring the cues our body shows us. But your sensitivity is a superpower. So if you are curious about how to become more of your favorite you, Join me here every week for deep dives intended to inspire you to uncover the wisdom within us all so that you can live with more ease, confidence, and joy. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Every Seven Years. On this podcast, we dive deep together every single week on how to optimize our health, our beauty, and our overall well-being naturally. I'm Sabrina, as you know, and today we are tackling a topic that affects many of us. I almost want to say all of us, especially in our fast-paced modern world, and that is high cortisol levels. It is safe to say that right now you are either in a state of fight or flight or in a state of rest and repair, and we need a balance of both, probably more rest and repair than the former, (laughs) But most of us, unfortunately, are living in the fight or flight, high cortisol, high adrenaline state for years and wondering why we feel burnt out, why we are tired and anxious all the time, but wired and we can't sleep, why we might develop blood glucose issues or hold on to belly fat or have gut issues. So whether you're dealing with job stress or past health issues, if you have OCD or ADHD, you also might be more susceptible if you have gut issues or you sleep poorly, if you were a former athlete or you put your body through any kind of taxing situation for a long period of time without proper rest, today's episode is packed with insights and actionable tips to help you to sleep better, to feel better, to perform better, and to look better. So let's start at the beginning with understanding what cortisol is before we go judging it. (laughs) So cortisol is our natural body's main stress hormone. It is created by our bodies in the adrenal glands. And it's actually crucial for helping us handle stressful situations. Like without it, we would not be as able to catch ourselves if we fell or handle stressful situations. What cortisol does in the body is basically amp us up and flood us with energy so that we can deal with difficult things and situations. And the idea is that once the threat has passed, our cortisol levels can return to normal, you know, in an ideal world. (laughs) Don't we all wish we could just stop doing any stressful activity ever? But hey, like sometimes even just driving on a highway is stressful. So it's almost impossible to avoid stress. So instead, there are things that we can do to trick our body into feeling a little bit less stressed. And we can lower these hormones and help regulate them in a healthy way. And so that's what I'm going to be getting into today. So why is cortisol a problem if it's natural? Well, like anything not in moderation, when cortisol levels are too high for too long, it throws everything off of balance. When chemical over or under production, either, are present, it disrupts the connections of all of our chemicals. And then our brain and our gut are no longer working smoothly together and our moods are out of whack. When this concentration is disrupted, our immunity also drops and our gut's protective barrier is compromised, which can then result in gut issues and skin issues. Like all things in the body and like nature, we need seasons. We need highs and lows, you know, times of working out and times of relaxing in a hammock. So cortisol, 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 sneaky little stress hormone can cause all kinds of issues. So let's talk about how excess cortisol for too long can show up on the body. What might be other symptoms of living with too high of cortisol levels for far too long. The first thing you might notice is 
unexpected weight gain or holding on to weight, particularly right in the lower belly. A lot of people refer to this as cortisol belly, which can even exist in the thinnest of people. It's this little area around the midsection that is almost impossible to get rid of. You also might notice weight gain in the face. The nice convenient thing about cortisol is it has this uncanny ability to hold on to fat and water, particularly in those two spots. Another symptom is hair loss, thinning hair. If you're tired all the time, but then you can't sleep at night. <laughs> if you have terrible long-term memory recall, like something that happened a long time ago, you're just like, it's gone. <laughs> If you find yourself feeling unusually anxious or depressed, or you're more prone to get emotional over even the littlest things, I've definitely had this problem. Other common signs are sleep problems, thin skin, brain fog, and issues around your blood glucose, even high blood pressure. Also, if you constantly crave sweets or salty foods, this is your body craving electrolytes and minerals, which can also contribute or be a sign of high cortisol. And another thing that doesn't really come up on Google, but I want to add to the list, is if you find yourself constantly scrolling your phone, or if you have a job with really heavy screen time, high screen time level jobs, people who go from working on a screen all day to watching TV at night or scrolling their phones all night and all morning, that adds a lot of people to the list who might not notice the above symptoms. And I say all of this without judgment because this was me. I struggled with high cortisol and symptoms of high cortisol and then living with the results of high cortisol for a long time. Quite frankly, I think throughout all of my 20s on and off from 2010 to 2020, I had so many of these symptoms because I was living hustle culture up, right? Like I was queen of hustling. Despite actually being underweight, I had that puffy face. I retained water and fat in my face, which many sufferers and practitioners now refer to as moon face or cortisol face. Because like I said, it helps you store water and fat in your face. So you couldn't see the bone structure in my face like you can now. Mind you, I am 30 pounds heavier, <laughs> but I think that my face looks thinner. I know I've also been doing face massage, but it all contributes. I also had adult acne and sleep issues for sure. But it's beyond uncomfortable. Like all of those things are uncomfortable to deal with when you have them, right? But it's also really harmful to live this way. It's not good to live with high cortisol. High cortisol can cause all kinds of mental health issues, depression, anxiety, it can also lead to sleep issues, which then affects your metabolism, which then affects things like your gut health and metabolic issues and diabetes. You're more prone to Alzheimer's and dementia. Like having high stress can probably be connected to almost every single thing that can go wrong in our lives. So how do cortisol levels get high? Obviously, the first thing that comes to mind is stress, right? Like you might think like a stressful job or something, but also consider stressful relationships. Think about how else stress comes out. Maybe you got like a new puppy and that was stressful, you know? Being stressed, be it physically or mentally, contributes to high cortisol. So anyone who lives a high intensity life, whether that's through a demanding job or you're really intense with your fitness routines, or you've been emotionally stressed from a really bad relationship or a bunch of terrible friendships. These can all lead us there. So anyone can have high cortisol for too long. Even if you just had grief and loss in your family, or you travel a lot, if you have taxed your body in any way for too long without equal and opposite amounts of true downtime and relaxation, you likely have some cortisol issues and might want to consider some practices and techniques that help manage that hormone and then all of your hormones and systems. So that makes cortisol issues particularly common among people who have a history of eating disorders or who are heavily into any kind of fitness training. Lucky me. <laughs> I did both at once before I stopped that and started yoga and walking 
and no high intensity workouts, but I'll get into healing stuff in a second. But back to what is causing high cortisol levels. And this shocked me. I was so surprised to hear that the heart of cortisol issues is nutrient deficiency. Maybe you guys have heard of Dr. Barbara. She's like a leading expert in the naturopathic medicine world. And she points out that often our cortisol issues stem from a simple but often overlooked cause being nutrient deficiencies. The three minerals that she points out being the leading ones that we are deficient in in our society and nearly everyone is because of our poor soil quality, etc., are magnesium, potassium, and sodium. So even getting like a great electrolyte uh, drink adder that doesn't have tons of added crap and sugars like element or something might help you. Even just adding some salt to your morning water with some lemon in it. Most of us are deficient in these nutrients. And because of that, we are then living with adrenal dysfunction. So get a supplement, you know, whether it's Athletic Greens or you go to your local wellness clinic and get a really great quality supplement, or you get a bunch of separate ones. You know, I actually make a magnesium spray called Pain Pain Go Away. And I made it a topical spray because that actually enters your bloodstream more effectively and you get more magnesium potency transdermally than you do when you ingest magnesium. So it also helps with restless legs. And if you have trouble sleeping, it's a little bit tingly when you spray it on. And obviously, if you're listening to this podcast, you get 30% off. So make sure that you check out Pain Pain Go Away possibly. But there's so many other supplements that you can get. Symbiotica also has some great transdermal magnesium products. But another thing that you could do that Dr. Barbara recommends specifically for nutrient deficiencies is Moringa. You can get Moringa as a powder or in a tea. You can make it as a tea or add it to a smoothie or into soup or something. And this can be a game changer if you're nutrient deficient. So I just ordered some myself and I have yet to try it, but I'm really excited to see if I feel like I thrive anymore as a result. Moringa also can help if you have stomach ulcers and arthritis. So really interesting and obviously high cortisol. Um, Moringa also has protein in it. It's one of the only plant products, real true whole food plants that has all of these minerals and protein. So Moringa, great thing. I'll be trying it and I'll let you guys know how it goes on Instagram on my close friend stories. So now let's talk about another thing that causes high cortisol, which is exercise. What the hell? (laughs) So sneaky because often people who appear healthy, athletes like a Serena Williams even, I don't know why she comes to mind, but maybe she doesn't have high cortisol, but people who are athletes and exercise a lot and intensely can have really high cortisol. So while high intensity interval training or HIT has its benefits, it is not the best activity for everyone and is definitely not a long-term plan. Doing high intensity workouts for certain people, especially women, can actually make you hold on to weight, especially if you already are living in a high cortisol state. Because you're running on such high cortisol that your body is holding on to fat and water as a protective mechanism with such desperation. So often, some people who have plateaued, when they stop HIIT training and instead walk, they find that those last few pounds or that last bit of weight does fall off. So interesting. So I think you're going to like this piece of advice. Stop high intensity interval training. Stop any kind of intense workout that is way too much of a spike that you're only going to do once a week or once a month because it's intense. Stop it. Instead, walk. Oh my God. Walking I feel like walking has changed my life. It's been a year now, definitely been a year. I should have marked the date when I started. An hour long daily walk with Piper, rain or shine. And I can't tell you how much my mental health has improved, how much my productivity has improved. I don't think I would have ever even got to recording if I didn't go on a daily walk because it just organizes your whole body for you. I feel like it organizes your hormones. It organizes your thoughts. It organizes what's important and what's priority and it gets you outside. And so I could go on and on about walking, but truthfully, walking is going to help everybody. Forget that this is even an episode on cortisol. Walking is going to help with everything else, but also yes, with cortisol as well. So 
make sure that you're stopping anything high intensity and you're replacing it with walking. And then if you find that you want to add something back in because walking isn't enough and you want to get more fit or you want abs and it's not giving it to you, if you want an activity, try yoga, body weight stuff, movement like that, or Pilates, or any kind of weighted dumbbell workout. Weightlifting is incredible. I'm always like shy to swear on my own podcast. It's hilarious. But I would want to swear a million times over how amazing the combination of walking and weightlifting is. Some simple at-home strength training moves. Just leaving out a set of dumbbells. I have some just off camera down there on the floor and I just leave them in front of the TV and I might do five minutes a day, 10 minutes a day. You do not need to work out a ton. Dave Asprey is famous for saying how he does once a week, a 20 minute workout. And that's how he has the best physique of his life. And people hate him for it, but I think he's totally right. I barely work out and I feel like I'm in one of the best physiques of my life. (laughs) And it's because of weightlifting. It's because the 20 minutes I do put in is like 20 minutes of lifting weights and then I walk every day. So I don't really count that as my activity and you shouldn't. It should just be part of your day. But weightlifting and yoga and walking will lead you to a better body in every way. You will not bulk up. You will change your body composition. You will gain muscle and muscle will act as an antidepressant. Having muscle on your body People don't know this, but it releases chemicals into your bloodstream that are similar to antidepressant medication and drugs by having muscle on your body. Like that's incredible. We have a built-in pharmacy right there waiting to be activated. So like I said, no matter where you're at weight-wise, the combo of walking and yoga and strength training will benefit you. There is no need for any kind of grueling workout ever. Stop that all together. (laughs) If you start looking around, I bet you'll see that the most beautiful people out there are relaxed. They go on walks and they have some kind of like yoga or strength training regime or Pilates. (laughs) So find a flow that feels good for you. But remember, overtraining can spike your cortisol. So keep your intense workouts to under an hour, ideally way less and no more than like a few times a month, maybe if that... (laughs) especially when you're menstruating, unless that feels really good for you, do not be working out as much as you are. So the next thing that can screw with our cortisol is inadequate sleep and rest. Essential yet often neglected still. Like we know that sleep and stress are linked, but how terribly and how vicious cycle they're linked is is awful. So stress actually causes a depletion of melatonin in your body. And this is a natural hormone that we all have that's responsible for triggering us to feel sleepy. So when you're stressed, you sleep less. And shitty sleep causes unhealthy levels of elevated cortisol, which then contributes to more stress and more cortisol. So when I say rest, I mean quality rest. We all know quality sleep is non-negotiable, but quality rest while awake is also so important. Like a slow walk in nature or lazing in a hammock or relaxing in a sauna or a salt bath or reading in bed. These kind of passive activities of rest can help lower your cortisol more than you might actually think. And so adding them to your day in bits will help you feel better in days. But it's not just about adding the good stuff. It's also making sure you're not spiking your cortisol at night with bad stuff too, like horror movies or even like Dateline (laughs) or like dramatic relationship shows. There's a reason why Mike and I put The Office on every night to fall asleep. You know, when we accidentally fall asleep to an action film, there is nothing worse than waking up to a gunshot or a party scene with loud noises. So don't watch cortisol-inducing things after 7 p.m. Done. That's your cutoff for your true crime podcast, okay? (laughs) Nighttime is for your rom-coms or your documentaries that aren't too dramatic. (laughs) No murder and death. (laughs) And then when it comes to sleep, it's at least eight hours, seven to nine. 
I don't know where along the line as a society, it's become the norm to sleep for five hours. The amount of people that I know who don't need to wake up or who don't need to be up early for work or who just stay up past 10 p.m. for zero good reason is insane. I'm calling you all out right now. (laughs) And I feel like there's this idea that, oh, good for you. You sleep eight hours. You must not have a lot to deal with. You know, but everyone I know who says this could easily find a routine in which they get eight or nine hours of sleep at night. But it's one of those things that unless you make a boundary around it and unless you care about it, you're not going to do it. Unless you have children or pets that are waking you up at night and you need to attend to them, there is no good reason why you shouldn't be getting amazing quality sleep every single night. So if you have to get an eye mask or blackout blinds or earplugs, block out the noise of society, I just don't think people realize how big of an impact it has on how you feel and how you operate. If you don't get good sleep, you're more likely to get dementia and Alzheimer's and diabetes and have metabolic issues and feel like shit. So why not figure out how to sleep really great if you do nothing else? Get eight and a half quality hours in a bed And tell me you don't feel worlds better in a few weeks. I could go on about sleep and I want to include this quote from Peter Atia. I've been reading a couple books. I meant to have them on the table here with me. But one is Outlive by Peter. And he says that disassociation between sleep and metabolic health seems puzzling at first. But the missing link here is stress. Higher stress levels can cause us to sleep poorly. And as we all know, poor sleep makes us more stressed. It's a feedback loop. So both poor sleep and high stress activates our sympathetic nervous system, which despite its name is the opposite of calming. It's the part of our fight or flight response that prompts the release of hormones, including cortisol, which raises blood pressure and causes glucose to be released from the liver while inhibiting the uptake and the utilization of the glucose in the muscle and your fat tissues, probably to prioritize glucose delivery to the brain. So he mentions that in the body, this can manifest as elevated glucose. Stress. Stress can cause insulin resistance. So anyways, I could continue just literally reading his book (laughs) for the rest of the podcast, because I am fascinated by sleep, but I think that's going to be a whole other episode sometime. I want to talk about sleep and dreams and how it affects our metabolism and our blood glucose and our cardiovascular health and our brain and like way too much. Um, He has great rules. If you have that book on how to improve your sleep, there's 10 rules on page 374 of Outlive. Highly recommend. Okay. But I digress. I think because of this whole lack of of sleep society, we've become really tolerant of feeling like shit. It's almost like a little pride badge too, like a, like a must be nice for them to the healthy people who get good sleep. And it is nice and you could have it too. It's not a personality trait. It's something that you can foster for yourself. (laughs) Nobody needs anything from you between the hours of 10 PM and 7 AM. So treat that like precious sacred time where your only job is to sleep. And if you are not sleeping between those hours, you're failing. Like treat it like that. So in our own life and in our home, I have made a lifestyle and designed our house to support these things. We've changed out furniture and even like the placement of things to support our sleep. Even where we live, we live in a small gated community so that it is very quiet. And when it's nighttime, it is pitch black. And I find I can't sleep. Like my sensitivity for light has gone up and noise has gone up where if I am in more of a city environment, it's tough for me to sleep, which yes, it sucks. But I'm so happy to return to my little black pod and get the most amazing quality sleep. And I know that because of my aura ring. I get at least a 90 sleep score when I sleep in my home environment and I do all of my healthy sleep rules. My average is 94. Today, I got a 93. (laughs) I got eight and a half beautiful hours. And this isn't a flex. Um, As a result, we've had to sacrifice a lot of things to have this. 
you know, it's a choice that we've made. It means that we say no to going out with friends and we're those people. But that is a choice that we've been willing to make for living healthier, happier lives. You know, it means that we're a little farther away from the city and the airport and even to a grocery store. It takes us 15, 20 minutes to be from home to in the store. And of course, we want all things, but all things considered, this is my dream. And living this way and changing my lifestyle and rearranging my bedroom and getting good blinds and, and, and has helped me sleep better. And that alone has changed my hormonal health for sure. Going on walks has changed my hormonal health. All of that. If we didn't live here and start supporting this more natural lifestyle, I don't think I would have started Healer. I don't think I would have seen through some of my interests in plants and herbalism and this podcast, etc. So I digress, but <laughs> back to causes of high cortisol and a solution for it. So we talked about sleep. We talked about rest, inadequate rest, working out too, way too hard. The next thing is fasting. Stop intermittent fasting. I know that's been a really hot topic lately, especially for women, but particularly for women, intermittent fasting is a little risky. When it comes to how and when and what you eat, if you are suffering with high cortisol, you have to start your day with food within an hour of waking up. If you're not hungry when you wake up in the morning, maybe for hours, that's actually a sign that you've been living with high cortisol. Or you maybe stuffed yourself right before bed because that can happen to the best of us. But if this is a habit, a near daily occurrence that you just don't eat for a few hours and you didn't gorge at midnight the night before, but you're just not hungry when you wake up, you might be living with high cortisol. So the key with undoing this is to eat a protein rich breakfast. And that means 30 grams of protein or more. And this has to be done within an hour of waking up. I know it's annoying, but this is to help stabilize your cortisol levels right from the start of your day. And I know it's not always wanted, especially people who live with high cortisol like I did. I wouldn't be hungry for hours. So intermittent fasting was like, oh, so convenient for me. Like this is easy for me. <laughs> but for people suffering from high cortisol, this is not a flex. This is a symptom. And this is an issue perpetuating other issues. So you have to eat within an hour of waking up. You know, a plate of avocado toast and eggs when you're not hungry is, you know, hard in quotation marks, but eventually you'll grow to need it and want it. And once your body is living with regulated hormones, you'll get hungry when you wake up. It took me a few weeks, but now when I wake up, I'm hungry and I want my eggs. And let me tell you a while ago, a year ago, that was not the case. In terms of what you eat, I recommend doing a morning smoothie. This is the best way to get all of the minerals and vitamins that you need in one go. As long as you're having enough protein and healthy fats in that smoothie and soluble fiber, that's like the best thing that you can have. Smoothies, I know, is like a hot topic. Some people really don't like them. Also, even in um, Ayurveda, having something cold is not necessarily healthy for certain body types like Vata, which I actually am. But I find my smoothie that I make for this little adrenal cocktail cortisol health is the perfect combination of all of the things I need. And then I drink my smoothie with some kind of like warm toast and peanut butter or with a fried egg on an English muffin with some cheese. I just make sure that I don't have only cold. Or if I do have only my smoothie, that's also when I have my coffee, which I'll get into in a second. I just want to make sure that I'm not loading my body with something totally freezing cold at the top of the day. So I love my smoothie. I need my smoothie, but I pair it with something warm as well. So a little bit of a side tangent, but important to mention. So my smoothie has lots of proteins, lots of healthy fats. I make sure that I put in blueberries and bananas. So I get my B vitamins and my soluble fiber. Blueberries are really high in soluble fiber. So are beans. Beans are amazing for if you have high cortisol, eat beans. <laughs> but anyways, my smoothie, I do blueberries. Probiotics are a must for this high cortisol diet. So having yogurt or kefir, easy to throw into a smoothie. Then throwing in some berries for vitamin C, which is vital, and a protein powder. And then I also like to do spinach. 
or any kind of leafy greens. I usually put like frozen spinach chops in there. And then I just add sometimes like a tablespoon of coconut oil or olive oil sometimes just to get a little bit of healthy fats in my smoothie as well or an avocado if I have one. Getting healthy fats is really important. So why I mentioned putting coconut oil in my smoothie or olive oil is because you need healthy fats to help manage your stress. So even on a salad or on pizza, drizzle some extra olive oil, even if it's already dressed. You can't go wrong. Drink it by the tablespoon if you like. (laughs) You just need those healthy fats. You need a good amount of protein. You need fiber. You need vitamin B and C. And you need vitamin D, which I'll mention later because you can get that from the sun. And that's really like the main vitamins you want, as well as the ones I mentioned earlier, like potassium, sodium, and magnesium as well. So like I said, that smoothie at the top of a day with your banana and your berries and your protein and your healthy fats and a little spinach, that's going to give you tons of good vitamins. Maybe even some ground flaxseed in there for fiber fortified milk for some vitamin D, obviously like the leafy greens I was mentioning for some magnesium. You don't need a bunch of fancy foods or supplements if you just have a few different whole foods a day. If you just have a good variety throughout the week of different vegetables and different fruits, you're going to be well on your way for eating well. You don't even necessarily have to follow a diet plan. And at night, a really great snack is a handful of blueberries with chocolate and pumpkin seeds. That's like a trifecta of hormone-happy foods that will help you sleep and feel happy and manage your hormones in general, especially your cortisol. Other foods that are really beneficial are anything anti-inflammatory. And it's also really important that no matter what you are eating, when you consume your food, you're in a relaxed and happy emotional state. Never eat when you are rushed. Never eat when you are stressed out or when you are crying or upset (laughs) because that will affect how the food is digested. That will affect your hormones. That will affect the nutrients that you can leach out of the food or not. So if I didn't mention it earlier, I think I said it with the berries in the smoothie, but vitamin C, that's also really vital for stress. So in that smoothie, strawberries and berries and citrus fruits and kiwis, pears in a salad maybe. Then when it comes to beverages, coffee lovers, I have bad news and some good news too. You don't necessarily have to kick it out altogether, but know that caffeine is a stimulant and it makes all of our hormones ramp up, including cortisol and adrenaline, but also estrogen. So especially if you're a woman, especially if you know you're estrogen dominant, it's best to avoid caffeine especially, especially, especially big, big facts on an empty stomach. Never drink coffee on an empty stomach and wait 90 minutes after waking up to drink it. Because if you are serious about managing your cortisol, this is one of the most impactful things you can do because caffeine naturally raises your cortisol and cortisol naturally raises as you wake up. So if you are naturally increasing your cortisol by simply waking up and getting out of bed, and then you're gonna like go do a workout and have coffee on an empty stomach, you are like triple spiking your cortisol. And then that experience will lead to a huge crash later in the day that you have to then constantly manage through this crave and stimulation and crash cycle until you pass out. So if you are going to have coffee, make sure that you have it after you've eaten something. And add ghee or coconut oil or some kind of fat to it. That will also really help avoid any of that jittery feeling. And if you are experiencing high cortisol, it is best to avoid it nearly altogether. So this is actually mushrooms with eight milligrams of caffeine. Eight. So even if I have three of these a day on a day where I'm having a lot of coffee in parentheses, that's only 24 to the 400. That's pretty great. So this is called Egano. I'll link it in the show notes. It does have some dark Arabica coffee in it. So it does taste like coffee, but it's mostly mushrooms. And it's amazing. It's so healthy. It's made in Indonesia. And they come in these individual little satchels that you could travel with. And they're $1 a satchel. It's what it works out to when you buy it on Amazon. So I have been having tons of 
luck is the wrong word. I've grown to love this stuff. I don't even like the taste of coffee now. I'm addicted to this. This is my third cup today. And I was like, oh, can I have it? I'm like, hell yeah, I can have it. Do you know how little caffeine is in here and how much good mushroom, like adaptogenic brain healthy stuff? And I put a little MCT oil in here, zero sugar. In fact, I put Symbiotica Magnesium uh, L3 and 8 vanilla cream. This shit is so good. <laughs> and if you want to say goodbye to coffee altogether, you don't want to find an alternative and you're just done with coffee. Matcha is actually a really great option because unlike this even, it has L-theanine and L-theanine boosts the alpha waves in your brain, which promote a sense of flow and reduces anxiety. Random side note, I saw a TikTok this morning of this neuroscientist who said a shot of espresso in a matcha drink, there's something about the combination of L-theanine and caffeine that lowers the risk of jitters and anxiety and improves symptoms of ADHD. Isn't that interesting? Fascinating stuff. So the next thing that supports healthy cortisol is proper sunlight on your skin and in your eyes so that your body knows to lower the production of cortisol at nighttime. So first thing in the morning, there are two rules. Number one, do not look at your phone. You can do so in 20 minutes time, but first thing your eyes need to see is the morning sun. So open your damn blinds and look outside. And then number two, get underneath the sun outside within 30 minutes of waking up. So I'm going to read another quote from a book I love called This Is Your Brain on Food by Uma Naidu. She says, 80% of our vitamin D comes from exposing our skin to direct sunlight. It's important to remember that sunlight streaming through our windows does not have the same effect. And with our indoor lifestyles being so prevalent, our skin is often left in the dark, literally. <laughs> As a result, vitamin D deficiency is occurring in epidemic proportions worldwide. And ain't that the truth? So if you can't get sunlight daily, or if you are a strict vegan or you suffer from milk allergies and getting enough vitamin D is a problem, supplementation or getting vitamin D through your diet is going to be really important. Foods that contain vitamin D would be fortified milk, egg yolk, salmon, sun-dried mushrooms, and cod liver oil. But far and away, the best way that you can get your vitamin D is through sunlight exposure on your skin, especially in the morning first thing. This will help not just your cortisol hormone, but all of your hormones. It will also lessen anxiety. I can't wait to do an episode on tanning and sun exposure and my disdain for sunscreen. It's all coming, but I want to dive a little deeper into it and like talk to a dermatologist possibly, or I don't know. I'm just, I, I can't wait to dive into sun stuff. But as it pertains to cortisol and overall wellness, well, first thing in the morning, very important. You do not need to spend an hour outside. Even literally five to 10 minutes is better than nothing. So go for a 10 minute walk. That's when you can do your walking <laughs> or drink your coffee or your matches standing outside or sitting on the deck. Even if it's cloudy, try to find the sun. Like, and what a way to stack in another healthy habit. You can do some grounding barefoot or like shaking it out, put your bare feet on the earth and do some like rebounding or your lymphatic drainage massage, possibly. <laughs> this will all help you later in the day with the management of your circadian rhythm. This will help signal to your body that it's time to start producing melatonin at night when you don't see the sun anymore and help you sleep better. Which brings me to having healthy light exposure habits in your home for controlling cortisol. Turn off your overhead lights. Anything above eye level should be off at night. If you need to, invest in some warm lights like table lamps or floor lamps. I have this great one behind me called Sky View. It actually changes color temperature throughout the day and turns red at night. And it creates a beautiful ambience as well, which is really the point, right? Like environmental factors play a huge role in our cortisol because we are material physical bodies interacting in our environments that affect us. 
everything affects us. So set the tone, mellow the mood within your living room and especially in your bedroom and your bathroom too. I think it's a good point that if you have like fluorescent lights on in your bathroom before you're getting ready to go to sleep at night and brushing your teeth with your eyes squinted under this bright light, that is not it. Maybe even having like a cute little salt lamp in your bathroom for nighttime. And it also just feels good curating this cozy, lovely home. So this one benefits beyond just your cortisol, but your overall self-concept and your mood, right? Your home is a reflection of you. Another thing that might be helpful if you want to take it a step further is blue light blocking glasses and screen filters. Okay, this one is not taking it a step further. Everybody should be changing the settings on their televisions to go down at night, brightness down, and on their phones and iPads. Because us humans have lived for eons with the only light at night being provided by a flame, which is warm, red cast, right? We're not used to blue light. Blue light doesn't exist naturally at night. Blue light equals day. So at nighttime, to help you maintain your natural rhythm, and signal to your body when it's time to wind down, some things that you can do after sundown is turn down the brightness of your television screens using your settings. You know, it might be annoying, but when you notice the sun go down, turn the brightness on your television down. On your desktops and laptops, make sure that you have Flux, F-L-U-X. This is a free desktop software that will change your screen temperature for you throughout the day based on what time you wake up and your time zone to create a pleasant pink cast light at night rather than that blue unhealthy light, which disturbs your sleep. And then on your iPad and iPhone, turn on the accessibility feature, which allows you to triple click the button to trigger a red light filter. These are all amazing practices to help foster healthy cortisol levels. So if you have high cortisol, definitely something to look into because all of us are guilty of being on our screens at night. What other natural ways might there be to manage high cortisol? These are where I like to, these are what I like to call AAA therapies, alternative anytime, anyplace therapies, and they can be quite effective. So for high cortisol specifically, and to calm the nervous system, I've been focusing on ear massage and EFT tapping or emotional freedom technique tapping. I've also been exploring techniques to stimulate the vagus nerve. Um, I discussed it two weeks back when I was doing a sound healing episode with humming and singing, which helps stimulate that nerve. And these all play key roles in helping our body and its relaxation response. Ear massage is a simple yet really powerful tool to reduce stress. So the ears have multiple pressure points and they're all connected to various parts all throughout our body. So by gently massaging these points, you can stimulate nerves that trigger a relaxation response throughout your body. So to massage your ears yourself, all you have to do is gently pull on your lobes and massage the outer edges in a circular motion, pulling and gradually moving towards the inner part of the ear with light pressure and your fingertips. And go slow and focus on areas that feel particularly tense as these might be linked to stress centers in your body. You can also just pull and hold for 10 seconds on two or three different areas and then make sure that you balance it out with the other ear as well. Another alternative therapy is emotional freedom technique tapping. So this It's kind of zany, but it's a psychological acupressure technique that is often recommended to manage anxiety and stress and emotional disorders. And this method involves tapping specific meridian points on the body while speaking affirmations out loud. There is a guy named the Tap Daddy on Instagram. I'll try and remember to link him in the show notes. And his videos are crazy popular. Thought to balance energy and reduce physical and more importantly, emotional pain. A lot of people have a ton of success with emotional issues. So you can look more into EFT after listening to this, but a great way to integrate it into your routine very simply is to start with identifying the issue you want to focus on and creating a simple affirmation around it. Once you've done that, you'll use your fingertips to tap gently 
on seven to 10 different points. And these include the top of the head, the eyebrow, the side of the eye, under the eye, under the nose, the chin, the beginning of the collarbone, and under the arm. And you'll want to do that with both hands as you do it. And the idea is while tapping, you will repeat your affirmation aloud to reinforce the positive messaging, help calm your mind, and program that message into your body through a physical action, through hitting these trigger points. And I know it sounds kind of zany, but some people absolutely swear by it. It hasn't been something that I have tried much, to be honest, but I wanted to bring it up because I do know friends who have tried it and had a lot of success with it. But something else I have tried and can highly recommend is vagus nerve stimulation. Like I was saying in the sound healing episode, our voice and humming and singing and toning and stimulating our vagus nerve is critical because when we do that, it calms the nervous system in this beautiful, like harmonious, magical way, which reduces cortisol and promotes relaxation. So outside of humming and singing or chanting a mantra, deep and slow breathing, focusing on those deep, slow breaths, inhale through your nose, expand your stomach fully, and then a really slow exhale out your nose or mouth. This kind of breathing stimulates the vagus nerve and this reduces stress. So it might not be very preventative, but if you are struggling with feeling stressed or with high cortisol and you know it, proper breath work and maybe attending a breath work class or doing a couple workshops will really, really benefit you. And before I leave vagus nerve stimulation on the table, I don't think I've mentioned this yet, but gargling also apparently engages the muscles connected to the vagus nerve and can be great for stimulation. So if singing and humming is not your jam, you can even just gargle because that is essentially singing with water in your mouth. <laughs> Another thing that is maybe not so preventative, but something that will help lower your cortisol if it is high and deal with some of the symptoms like puffiness and water retention is self-lymphatic drainage massage. So if you have, you know, that puffy face or you are bloated, doing self-massage all over your body is going to be really, really beneficial. You can look up myofascial techniques. You can look up lymphatic drainage. You can use a dry brush. There are so many different ways to stimulate your lymphatic system, a sauna, rebounding, doing Dr. Perry's big six, which just takes a few minutes every morning. All of these tiny little techniques can be integrated into your daily routine and just add it to your arsenal so that when you do feel increased stress, Pick and choose any one of these things and see if it helps you. What else fosters healthy hormones and in a more preventative way, in a way that will help them not raise in the first place, yoga and meditation. Big duh. But these practices are well known for a reason. They are known to reduce stress and they are going to be a wonderful addition to managing your cortisol. These practices are well known not only for their ability to reduce stress, once it's already there, but I believe they also help prevent it in the first place. Yoga is such a mindset and lifestyle practice. As you practice more and more and bring it into your life, you start to realize that it is a little bit of a way of life. And I know that sounds cheesy, but as you practice yoga more and more, you realize that your mindset shifts. Things don't bug you quite as much anymore. You're not as attached to situations or outcomes Things don't affect you as strongly or negatively as they once did. And this is in part because of all the mindfulness that goes into yoga. And it's also that when you're working out and you're using your body and you're doing breath work throughout a vinyasa flow, you're not thinking of other shit. Your stressful items on your to-do list are not present and you're prioritizing what feels good. You're prioritizing moving energy through your body in a way that's healing you, in a way that's helping you regenerate. So I know I mentioned yoga and meditation as one of the last points, but I think it's vital. Specifically poses like child's pose, cat and cow, legs up the wall, and shoulder stand. These are so easy to implement every day or every couple days, and they're going to help lower your cortisol. 
So make it a part of your practice. Get a yoga pass or just try a couple moves at home every once in a while. Another thing I do, and I almost forgot to include this, but it's such a powerful method for lowering cortisol, is aromatherapy the use of essential oils. We have been using this tool for stress management for hundreds, thousands of years. Essential oils like lavender and frankincense and bergamot can be introduced as methods for calming your mind and your body. You can either do this through inhalation. You can do this through topical application of the oil, the pachote method, where you put it in your belly button or simply anywhere on your skin to help absorb into the bloodstream, these will help lower your cortisol levels and you'll smell incredible. They also have so many other benefits. And if you're listening, you do get 30% off of my essential oil blends at Healer. And honestly, these are the dark horse of my product categories. I think that they are the underdogs of every product that I sell and make. A lot of people are like, I love your shampoo. I love your face oil. I'm like, yeah, Have you tried any of the essential oil blends? Because those are the things that I'm most passionate about. I think they make the biggest impact. They're the hardest thing to sell because they require education. But let me tell you, (laughs) I use them as a diffuser and it makes my home smell great. I use them when I want to podcast, when I want to go in public, when I want to go grocery shopping, when I'm feeling like I want to relax. I have specific oil blends for all different kinds of ailments for all different kinds of wellness boosting needs. So do check them out. They're under the energy healing blends section and I can't recommend them enough. And of course you get 30% off with code every seven. So check it out. And before I wrap up here, conveniently, I'm finishing my mushroom coffee as I wrap up the episode. (laughs) I wanted to share a little bit about my own supplement regimen because herbalism has been huge to help me deal with cortisol. And outside of having my daily walk, outside of limiting my caffeine and having my mushroom coffee instead, outside of adding my magnesium cream or using my magnesium spray and having my good smoothie with all my stuff, I also take some supplements. So apart from the vitamins and minerals that I already mentioned, like how vitamin C and D are important, how B vitamins are important, how obviously like potassium and magnesium are important. I want to bring up adaptogenic herbs like ashwagandha, rhodiola, and holy basil, which are known for their ability to help the body adapt to stress. These are going to be valuable additions to your life if you struggle with cortisol. I specifically like an adaptogenic tonic that blends a couple different herbs, and it's from St. Francis Herb Farm, and it's called Stressed, which is spelt S-T-R-E-S-T. And this is a stress relieving mixture of rhodiola, holy basil, ashwagandha, Siberian ginseng, milky oat seed, and schisandra root. Each of these on their own are highly beneficial, but I like this tincture because it gives me a little bit of all of them. And maybe you don't want to get the tincture. Maybe you just want to get one. If you're going to get one herb, get ashwagandha because ashwagandha increases your resistance to stress and anxiety. What I like about it is that it doesn't just lower your cortisol only for it to be raised again, but I like that it increases our tolerance for stress. So we don't react as poorly to it if it is going to be there. So if you're going into a stressful situation, if you're traveling, if you know that you're going to have a day at work, take some ashwagandha so that you can increase your tolerance for the stress that you're going to have later. I also take L-tyrosine and this helps our brain and protects our brain from the adverse effects of stress. It also helps if you have osteoarthritis pain, which is interesting. Um, So I figure, hey, it might even be extra beneficial for me because as I teach yoga more regularly, it might help support my joints because I'm not someone who drinks a ton of milk or has a ton of dairy. So maybe I'm prone to arthritis. So for me, it's a preventative wellness measure there, and it helps protect me from stress. In terms of teas, because herbalism and teas and supplements are just naturally all together, I love a passion flower and valerian tea that I have for nighttime. I'll also post this in the show notes. This helps me get high quality sleeps and manage anxiety, and it also has amino acids. Um, naturally in passion flower. 
And lastly, while I'm on teas, I also want to call out proper hydration. Oh my gosh. Like drinking enough water, we know is overlooked and it's crucial for maintaining optimal cortisol levels. I don't know if you know this. Dehydration can actually stress the body further, which raises our cortisol, as we know. So yes, get adequate water throughout the day. Make sure that you're hydrated, but also make sure that you're getting electrolytes. So maybe add some salt to your water to help you retain the minerals and the hydrogen so you're not just peeing everything out. (laughs) And I know once again, that was like 15 or 16 different things. But I want to provide you guys with a broad array of options and techniques and tools to experiment with so that all of us who have different lifestyles and preferences can be supported. Like everything that I've mentioned has its own set of benefits. And all of these things can be tailored to your individual needs. You don't have to do them at certain times. They don't have to be done to a T. If you want to manage your cortisol levels naturally, pick and choose a bunch of different things. And for the Coles notes, for anyone who maybe suspects that they're living with high cortisol, here are some things that you can do. First and foremost, reduce your high intensity activities. Any demanding jobs or intense fitness routines, any kind of restrictive, stressful anything on your body, say goodbye. It's out of your life. (laughs) Next, address your nutrient deficiencies, especially magnesium, potassium, and sodium. These support your adrenal function, and when you don't have them in proper amounts, cortisol is going to be spiked. Make sure that you're getting proper exercise. So switch from that HIIT interval training to more moderate activities like walking and weightlifting. Make sure you're getting quality sleep and quality rest, adequate seven to nine hours a night, and make sure that you have passive restful activities in your day, like lying in a hammock or relaxing in a sauna or a bath. Avoid intermittent fasting. Avoid fasting of any kind. Eat a protein and fat-rich breakfast within an hour of waking up to help stabilize your cortisol levels. Part and parcel to this, reduce your caffeine intake. Limit it to 400 milligrams or less and never drink coffee on an empty stomach. Make sure you're getting sunlight on your skin first thing in the morning and in your eyes, not through a window, directly underneath the real sun outdoors. This will help manage your circadian rhythm. Make sure that you have healthy light practices. Use blue light blocking glasses. Make sure that you have your screen filters on, that you have flux installed, that you are editing your iPad and your iPhone with red color filters at night. Try alternative techniques like ear massage or EFT tapping. Maybe even vagus nerve stimulation through deep breathing or singing or gargling. Practice the stress relieving activity of yoga and meditation, not only to lower cortisol, but to avoid it rising in the first place. Consider using herbal supplements and aromatherapy. Adaptogenic herbs and essential oils support our body's stress response and promote relaxation. And last but not least, make sure you're properly hydrated. And when you do eat and drink, you're relaxed and in a good emotional state. All of these small steps can lead to huge changes in how you feel every single day. Remember, this is not a sprint. This is a marathon where every seven years you're turning over and becoming a new person. And I know it can be overwhelming. So remember to take small steps. Integrate one of these things a day or one of these things a week and then see how you feel. Use yourself as the thing that gives you feedback to see, damn, that made me feel better. Nah, that thing's not for me. There's so many little things in here that you can pick and choose. So I hope this helps. And if you are suffering with high cortisol, give these things a try. And if you have a family member or a friend who you might suspect is suffering or who you know is suffering, please consider sending this episode to them and seeing if it would help so that we can all live feeling a little bit better and more relaxed and more beautiful. Let's all join together in relaxing ourselves so that our society can be become one that is a little more relaxing. (laughs) I thank you once again for tuning in. I thank you every week and I mean it. Thank you. This means a lot to me. I know every single individual person listening and I appreciate all of you. So take care of yourself. And as always, I will see you guys next week. Bye. 
As a member of my podcast, you have no idea how much it means to have your support. And if you would consider sending or sharing any episode with a friend or loved one, I would appreciate it so much. And don't forget to use code EVERY7 at healer.ca, H-E-E-L-R dot C-A. That is my personal brand for you to get 30% off of your entire order. 